my name is Laurie Maloney. I'm an academic language therapist. I've been practicing in the area for a number of years. I also am president of the, of the uh, board of the DC Capital Area branch of the International Dyslexia Association. I'm also the mom of a couple of dyslexia kids. And um, if I went and got tested, I would probably that's quite like a number of my workshops. So, uh, I'll be speaking to you go today uh, as a as a practitioner. Uh, and and we're gonna take about a 55 minute tour of the structure of the English language. I want to explain to you what is involved in taking a non reader to a uh, grade level or above reading fluency, and it can be done. And I'll show you exactly how. The term dyslexia comes from the ancient Greek language. It simply means difficulty with language. This is a prefix means impaired or difficult, lex lexicos. Uh, it means words, so difficulty with words. It's a several thousand year old term, so this likely is not new. It dates back to the origin of Greek language. This is the IDA definition of dyslexia. It's uh, embraced by most people in the field, and um, I think it's quite a good and apt definition. It is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. That means it's brain-based. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. This is the most important part of this definition. Um, that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities. So these are generally average to above average uh, children who just have this, this particular issue. And the provision of effective classroom instruction, meaning that they can go to good schools, have good teachers, and still not learn. Secondary consequences include problems in reading comprehension, reading experience, and a depressed vocabulary and of course related to that background knowledge. And I first wanted to tell you what dyslexia is not. Because um, most people think, who don't know, that dyslexia merely means writing backwards. In the elementary school close to my house, a 40-year veteran elementary school teacher had claimed that she'd never had a dyslexic in her class in all those years. Most likely because none of her students reversed their letters. But um, she probably taught or didn't teach um, <laughs> many, many, many thousands of children over those 40 years. It's not just a reading problem, it's a spelling problem, it's all kinds of other issues tied in. We'll go through those today. There is the assumption that more boys are uh, affected than girls. And if I didn't know better, I would say that's true because I see probably five boys to every one girl over the years. I think boys just are identified and sent for treatment more frequently than girls. It may have to do with the fact that boys um, uh, are boys <laughs> and they're active and uh, they, the girls just fall through the cracks. They're quiet, they're easy to, to teach, uh, they don't make they don't make a scene, but the boys seem to come for academic therapy much more frequently than the girls. And, however, um, internationally, boys are affected just as much as girls. So, um, and also, it crosses socioeconomics, it crosses languages, ethnicities. Uh, it's one, it's uh, 15, they say 15% of the population. In some classrooms, I think teachers would say more, but mm -hmm. anyway. Dyslexics will never become normal readers and spellers. I know that's not true. Uh, I see it every day in my practice. Um, dyslexics can become very good readers, and they can come to be good spellers. But the spelling will always lag behind the reading. That's my experience. And uh, they will read, but they may read more slowly than their peers. 
um, dyslexia is a vision problem that can be corrected by vision therapy. If you go to the, um, the uh, Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmologists, they'll tell you that um, vision issues do not cause dyslexia. The eye muscle problems do not, do not uh, are not related to dyslexia. They may be um, coexisting, like strabismus or some other kind of eye muscle weakness, but one is not causative. And you're not really going to uh, cure a reading problem with muscle therapy unless the problem truly is a vision issue. So save your money. Uh, <laughs> finally, there is the belief that, that Albert Einstein is dyslexic. And we love to say that he's dyslexic because it makes us feel like and we do think of geniuses. But actually, he was not dyslexic. He had other, other things going on. Um, he, he might have been diagnosed as maybe slightly Asperger's. But um, his, uh, records of his early writing and grammar and spelling don't show any of those. But we love them anyway. <laughs> okay, so what are the diagnostic patterns? Now these are generalizations. Not every student is going to fit this, this profile. But on average, uh, my students tend to be average to highly, highly gifted as a, as a general rule. Um, they have other strengths which are pretty impressive, even the young ones. And I always feel like I have a presence of greatness even though I'm a second grader. I can just tell there's something really special about, about these students. And they go on to be people who map the human genome or discover wireless technology or, or um, you know, start uh, big companies, <laughs> uh, like make sure we have light in our homes, things like that, important things like that. They, um, often have good oral language, they have good imagination, they are creative and inventive. Um, so it, their inability to read well and write is sometimes quite confusing to, to others around them. They do score low on measures of digit span. You've heard about the issues with processing speeds. I work with students who have uh, a verbal IQs at the 99th percentile, processing um, indices at the 99th percentile, their memories are good, and their processing speed is below the first percentile. And you see this extraordinary gap. Um, these students don't look like stellar students in the classroom, but they are the most brilliant kids uh, in the building. <laughs> so you never know. Red flags. Okay, so speech, and we can see this in, in children pre-kindergarten. Um, they have difficulty uh, picking up nursery rhymes, days of the week, sequences, uh, saying the months of the year. For some reason, most of my students leave off October. I don't know why. Has anybody yeah, seen September and October? What is that? Yeah. September and October. September, November? Yeah. I don't know, but I... It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm going to have to find out if anybody knows why that happened. Um, I was once showing a syllable card to a student. The letters were T-A-L. And he read Tau. He said, that's what you put on when you get out of the bath. <laughs> uh, so they have, they have problems hearing the sounds in syllables and words. That goes back to what I was saying earlier about phonological awareness and the processing deficit. Um, they have difficulty uh, hearing the sounds in syllables, the syllables in words, and even the words in sentences. So it's a real issue with the, with the phonological <laughs> aspect of our language. Uh, they can have difficulty uh, with word find, with retrieval, with, with um, speaking in a succinct way, cluttered language, things like that. Of course, you've probably heard kids say things like biscotti or um, ranch brunch, <laughs> things like that. Okay. Is, can you tell me if you're a parent here? Um, professional? 
classroom teacher, diagnostician, um, has anyone heard a dyslexic try to read out loud? <laughs> okay, so you know, they have a kind of a halting, struggling way about their reading. Some can't read at all. I, I worked with a 21-year-old uh, young man who could not even read Cat in the Hat. Um, wouldn't even try. Couldn't, couldn't decode the most basic of, of uh, syllables. They, um, they will uh, miss, say, words in a sentence. They'll insert uh, syllables that aren't there. They'll insert letters that aren't there. They'll skip lines when they're reading. Um, they will look at a word, a multi-syllable word. They'll look at the first few letters, and then if it sounds like another word that they know, they'll just pop it in. They're not decoding. They, um, I once babysat a three-year-old boy who, for a friend of mine, who read an entire book to me, and I thought that he was extremely precocious uh, with his language generally. I mean, his oral language was extraordinary, and I thought, my goodness, he's reading it. And what I found out was that he had memorized a couple dozen books on his shelf and could read them beautifully. And so anyway, this is what they do. Um, they have difficulty uh, remembering even sight words. But they, they comprehend generally very well. Okay, for written spelling, um, I once had a student who was trying to write the word yacht. So he spelled it Y-O-G-H-T, crossed it out. Y A C G T crossed it out and then wrote boat. <laughs> um, they just give up. They write the same. They'll write a word differently in one paper, like does D U Z D O S E D O S, and then maybe D O E S. And this could be a word that we have worked on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, the letters may be poorly formed. A lot of students. If they're not uh, dysgraphic, they have some degree of difficulty with you know, graphomotor control. Uh, the problem is that they are scanning their visual memory for the word and they can't retrieve it. And this goes back to how they were taught, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, what are the comorbidities? Terrible word. <laughs> Just means all that other stuff that can, can come along with dyslexia. Um, just to make things more interesting. So the dyscrafia, as I mentioned, is a, is a real issue with writing. And it's not fine motor. Um, I had a student who can play the bass guitar like you cannot imagine, which requires a lot of finger dexterity. It's extraordinary. But if you pick up a pencil, you can see the weakness in his hand. He has an atypical grip, a maladaptive grip, like this. And and it, it's almost as though he's not getting any strength from the, from the elbow down. It's amazing. Um, his, his writing was very sloppy. Uh, he could not spell, uh, didn't want to write. So he's not um, getting that language down on paper, and it shows up in his grades. The oral and written language learning disability sort of sits on top of the underlying dyslexia it's regarded as a as a, an additional learning issue. This is where the language organization comes <coughs> in, the, uh, the the syntax, the semantics, all of that comes in. And I treat that as well. Most of my students have issues with written language. So I teach them to, to read and to handwrite and to spell and then we move on to um, to language production generally. They can have ADD, ADHD, executive dysfunction, and um, because of some of their retrieval issues, they don't um, often do well in that. Okay. Um, the majority of my students get a diagnosis of dyslexia, and they come and we start working together. But I wanted to put up this slide because in all my years, I, I have never met a student that reminded me of another student. They're so different. So they all get the label. But when you put them under the microscope, or I start working with them day to day to day, I realize they're, they're just 
so utterly unique. And it's really important to, to understand that while these children, young adults, have clearly have uh, academic <coughs> issues, they have a lot of strengths. And we need to recognize those and, and help them develop that. Dyslexia exists on a continuum. And this has implications for the choice of intervention. So uh, a lot of dyslexics go undiagnosed, unrecognized, untreated. Um, others are clearly having issues that need an intervention. Um, and we'll talk more about those interventions in a second. OK, so has, is, anyone, is anyone dealing with a dyslexic child but they haven't gone through the testing process yet? So we'll come. All right. Um, only licensed clinical psychologists or speech pathologists or maybe even a family physician, anyone who's licensed will make the diagnosis and, and um, offer the recommendations. The process can take uh, a couple of months if you can get it. I, I know a lot of the diagnosticians locally are, have really long waiting lists. But anyway, you'll have a parent intake. You'll give the family history. Um, the teachers will be surveyed. They'll provide information. There may be a classroom observation that's recommended. And then uh, the testing, depending upon the issues that are brought up in the intake, the testing could last um, a couple of hours to a couple of hours over a couple of days, depending upon um, the concerns. Um, an IQ test is typically done. This gets at verbal and, um, and perceptual reasoning. I have found that some of my students can be off the charts verbally and still be dyslexic and have uh, <coughs> lower uh, perceptual reasoning abilities. Or those could be very high, but the memory, the working memory and processing speed could be very low. So you really want to have that uh, x-ray vision into them workings of that brain so that you can truly understand what the strengths are um, and then what areas really need to be uh, addressed. With working memory and processing speed, these are, these are tough because you can't get in there and actually rewire the brain for these things. These are capacities. And so uh, my in my practice, I will work with children to uh, sort of compensate for these, for these issues. Again, based on the concerns, that diagnostician will choose from a number of testing instruments that will be appropriate uh, for that child. OK, so how did we get here? Um, Louisa uh, cook Motes is a sort of giant in the field of dyslexia. She's, she's worn many hats over the years. And I think at this point now, she's a consultant. But, um, there's nothing about the human brain that's wired for reading and writing. It's unnatural to the human being. So these skills have to be taught. And for dyslexics, they have to be very carefully, explicitly taught. Um, the, I, this girl in the picture is holding up something called a horn book. And those are examples of horn books. And they contain the alphabet, upper lowercase alphabet, a prayer, and then um, the numbers, the, the numerals. So kids would walk around, and this was really their first textbook. So there was some interest, even back in the early 1400s, for, for people to develop some kind of literacy. Uh, between 1600 and our independence, the Bible was the textbook. So, so the students were learning to read so that they could read the Bible. Now, if you notice, there's a focus on the letters of the alphabet. Because that's how, from 3000 3, BC to, uh, to uh, eight, uh, 1920, 1920, there was an emphasis on the alphabetic code. That is that letters have sounds, and letters form words, and words are based on sounds. And if you map the sounds to the letter, you can eventually learn to read words. That was a really important, obvious concept for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. 
these are the first American textbooks. Um, I had I had one and I, and I lent it to somebody and I forgot who, but anyway, it, they're really fascinating to look at. If you saw one, if I brought it in and showed you, you would say, oh my gosh, I could never learn that. That is so boring. It's just so boring. It's like, who cares? Letters and little symbols and, and ugh, I don't really want to do that. And a lot of folks didn't want to do that, but this is how, this is how students learn to read. Um, this was Noah Webster's effort to um, um, sort of codify the rules of the language and then share them with people so that there was a scope and sequence, that there was a way to teach reading, spelling, and writing in a logical, organized uh, way. 60 million copies, that's a lot of books back then. So this was uh, a very popular book that disappeared, like stopped being printed, boom. <laughs> these are the folks, I call them the dirty dozen. Um, these are all lovely people who had no um, malice in mind when they uh, espoused the viewpoints that they did. But because, um, you know, 70 kids were packed into a, a little red one room schoolhouse and were bored out of their minds, they decided that kids should just go straight into literature and they should learn letter sounds, they should learn word meanings, they should learn uh, spelling patterns incidentally by osmosis. And they will, they'll just look at a word and, uh, long enough and they'll make the connection that a given word is pronounced a certain way. So they will take a mental snapshot of that word and file it away in their in their memory bank, and it works. It really, truly works for 75% of the population. <laughs> so um, folks like Arthur Gates and William Gray, they start making money uh, publishing basal readers. And so in 1929, we have the Dick and Jane series. And my parents, who are in their late 80s, um, ex were exposed to the Dick and Jane series, so it goes way back. And as these basal readers become more popular, the, the uh, very technical uh, rule books disappear, little by little by little by little, over the decades, through the 1900s. This is when my industry cropped up. This is the beginning of the reading disabilities cottage industry. Isn't that interesting? So this is where we are now. While only 15% of students could be uh, considered truly uh, dyslexic, right now in this nation, 64% of fourth graders and 66% of eighth graders are reading below the level of proficiency. And about 30% of them nationally don't read at all can't read at all. These statistics are consistent with the, the statistics in the state of Maryland, maybe a point or two off. And that's not, we're not talking about Center City, Baltimore. Now they have a, a much greater problem. My students live within five miles of here, and I see a lot of them. Um, so we can't say that this is because they have a brain-based uh, wiring issue. It's precisely the way that they're being taught. Now again, um, I need to make it very clear that I respect teachers. That I, I think they do an extraordinary job. I find fault with the deans of the departments of education in uh, <coughs> colleges across the country right now because we've known for several decades, what is the best way to teach, not just the, the struggling dyslexics, but all students. And for some reason, uh, science doesn't appear to have a voice with these folks. And this is what I spend, when I'm not, in the, when I'm not working one-on-one, -on -one, I'm working on legislation and things like that. Um, lobbying for legislation. Um, okay, 80% of, of families didn't purchase a book last year. And 50, 
7% of books go unread. So we're really now becoming a nation of non-readers. I mean, we read texts and we do things like that. But we're not sitting down with a good book. And, um, and, and well, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Um, in the Common Core, they said two years ago, or two years ago, we're going to de-emphasize fiction and we're going to start focusing on non-fiction. We need people to be able to read manuals and things like that. And they got rid of cursive about three years ago. And I'll talk more about cursive in a second. But there was a study done a couple of years ago about the development of empathy and whether um, it makes a difference in developing empathy, whether one reads nonfiction, science fiction, speculative fiction, uh, what we would call popular fiction. And what they found was that those students in the study who read literary fiction, what you and I would call quality fiction, um, had measures of empathy that were much higher than those who had um, read nonfiction or science fiction or romance novels, that kind of thing. So we as a society do ourselves a disservice by uh, suppressing uh, literary fiction in favor of other forms of writing. And um, I think getting rid of person was a disaster for reasons I'll explain. I wanted to point out two organizations here. Yes. I have a quick question. Yeah. Does it affect it if they have like an actual book from actually reading on a tablet? Because no, it's just exposure to language. It doesn't matter whether they're listening on tape, mm -hmm. having someone read to them, reading themselves, it's getting the, the ideas, the language, the experience, the reading experience. Okay, there are two major organizations um, that deal with literacy. One is the International Literacy, literacy Association, formerly the International Reading Association. Um, <coughs> this, this organization promotes whole language, and I'll talk about that in a second. But that, that sight word reading, um, don't bother with the phonics, don't break words down into syllables, don't go there. Just give them rich language, you know, text, and let them sort of figure out the structure of, of language. Uh, they're about a $20 million organization. They have lobbyists. They're very connected to the textbook companies, folks on the Hill. I call it, this is my personal opinion, you're not going to find that on the internet, that's the uh, education industrial complex. Why do I think that? Well, if we really know how to teach students to read, and we know this from the National Reading Panel that was put in place in, in uh, the late 1990s, into 2000, early 2000, uh, they established what those critical elements for, for instruction are, and we're not seeing those changes in our universities teachers and we really haven't adopted those teaching practices in schools and that explains the first bullet. Can you talk about why that is now? I mean I've heard that before that money, it's all money, textbook money, like who, who is benefiting from the universities not teaching this to their students? It's, well, I'm going to just put it out there. They don't know what to do. They don't know what it means wrap your arms around the structure of the English language. It's very complicated. You'll see in a few minutes. Um, I don't think they know how to change. I mean, I don't think anybody is, is, uh, is excited about that first bullet. I don't think anybody wants to defend that first bullet. But I don't think, I actually don't think they know how to. It's a little like going from cold to solar. How do you do that quickly? They don't know what to do. But they're not even taking baby steps to get to There them. are a couple. There are probably 40 universities in the country out of over 4,000 that have become accredited, uh, that who, whose reading programs for future teachers are excellent. And I can talk more about that as we go. But it's, you know, that's, we're talking several generations before we start doing the right thing. Um, the International Dyslexic Association that started um, in the um, mid-1900s based on the work of Dr. Samuel Orton. You've all heard OG. OG is not a program. It's a set of teaching principles. It's, it's, it's a philosophy of teaching. And it's not necessarily okay for a program to say it's OG-based 
if it doesn't truly honor the principles that that importance and uh, Anna Gillingham and some of those other folks put forth. And I'll explain more as we go. I'm going to show you what, what, what's involved. Um, the IDA has just put out what it calls the Knowledge and Practice Standard. So if you go to, to the IDA website and you click your way through, you'll find a document that lays out what teachers must know, classroom teachers must know, to do a good job of teaching kids how to read. So I encourage you to go there. Uh, they've also set up, well, helped set up a standalone organization called SERI, Center for Effective Reading Instruction. Um, all the tools and methods and things like that. And an exam. So teachers can take an exam today to see if they have the requisite skills and knowledge to teach um, all children in the classroom. But it's a little organization, definitely. Unfortunately, it needs uh, it needs to grow because it's really doing the right thing. Okay, these are the, the just some terminology for you as I go through the next part um, of the presentation. Phonology is simply the study of the sound structure of our language. Phonics is the pairing of letters to their sound. There are 26 letters in the alphabet, 44 or 45, depending on who you talk to. Unique English speech sounds. And there are 98 ways to spell those sounds if you added them all up. So now we're starting to get into some of the complexities of the language, and you'll see that teaching reading really is rocket science. We have to do a better job of preparing teachers. You can go through your education program and not take a course on reading. Or you can take one course, but it doesn't really deal with the stuff I'm about to show you. Um, okay, phonological awareness. That is, in the absence of printed language, the ability to, um, to access the phonemic level, the sound aspect of spoken language. Rhyming, clapping, syllables and words, counting words and sentences. These are all examples of phonemic awareness activity. And then pho uh, phonological, did I say <coughs> phonological? Okay, phonemic awareness is a, is a slightly more difficult uh, activity, and that involves being able to discern the speech sounds in a word, hear those sounds. It's like the boy who, who um, said that the that tau, T-A-L, is something that you put on after a bath. He's not hearing the sounds. So he, we, we would say he has poor phonemic awareness. Okay, so what are the elements of an effective intervention? The, the phonemic and phonological awareness activities I talked about would come first. We do a lot of oral language, uh, work with cubes and felts to, to uh, consciously listen for the number of syllables in a given word and then the sounds within those syllables. And this is in the absence of letters at this point. Then uh, letter recognition, alphabet sequencing. Um, a number of my students come on the first day, they can't name all of the letters. And they might be 12 years old. So something's really going on. So we work on that. They need to be able to name all the letters and put them in alphabetic order. Um, the sound syllable pairing can take a couple of years if I'm working with a severe dyslexia. And it's a very slow, careful rollout of letters. Letters have four properties. They have a name. They have a look, either printed or cursive. They have a sound. And then they have a feel. In the, in the motor system, the, uh, the uh, graphomotor, gross motor, and also the uh, oral motor. So we work on all of that to make sure that they can um, they have all, all of those properties built in um, and they're taught simultaneously. Why is that? Why is that important? Why is, it impo why is it critically important that a student learn all of those properties of a letter in the same moment? Because right now we have handwriting taught as a separate activity. We have 
uh, letters and their sounds taught as a separate activity, and there isn't that integration that's so important. So I regard this aspect as the most important part of my practice. When I teach a letter, I teach the name, the sound, the cursive, cursive shape, and the way it feels in the mouth and in the arm, um, because I want there to be that same kind of linkage in the brain. And that's really important. And that's often not done in classrooms. These skills are taught in isolation. There's no connection in the brain. That's why, in spite of uh, months to years of intervention, you may not see the gains that you hope to see. So that integration is critically important. Um, when the cursive shape is linked to the sound, at that moment of instruction, you are creating a good speller. You are creating a new approach to spelling. So the child is not going to tap into the visual memory of the look of a word, but he now has the skill to be able to go from left to right and hear those sounds, translate them into shapes, and, and, and write the word sound by sound, syllable by syllable. So that makes the handwriting piece of this critically important. So uh, I like cursive. Cursive, uh, there's something about the, the, the finiteness of a word. It starts here and ends here. Um, it's a unit. Uh, there are four approach strokes to, uh, for all of the lowercase cursive letters. There are 11 approach strokes with print. So you're reducing the number of choices that a student has to make. Um, and then there are studies coming out with a, a professor at Berninger at the University of Washington in California who's done a lot of studies. And she says that the use of cursive early um, helps develop language in the brain. So handwriting undergirds reading fluency. The next thing is, um, once my student is you know, coming along, we work on things like uh, vocabulary development. And I, I'm in favor of teaching Greek and Latin prefixes, roots, and suffixes, even to third graders starting around third grade. This helps with spelling, and it um, can grow the vocabulary exponentially. We also look at text analysis for comprehension. We focus a lot on idioms. Uh, verbal phrases, um, just non-literal language metaphors, things like that. A lot of my students are very concrete in their thinking, and um, they really need this instruction. And then finally, we, we work on academic writing. And if there's time, I'll, I'll show you some of the techniques I use for that. Okay, so these are the these are the uh, principles of, of the old Orton Gillingham. Um, and they just make good sense. So it's direct, explicit, sequential, multi-sensory uh, instruction in the language, pace to the student, because we have, as you heard earlier, kids who process more so. Um, they do things in the lesson. They're moving, phoning cards. There's a quick rotation of tasks to keep them interested. There's a lot of um, dialogue, so they're they stay involved, they have to answer questions. And um, and the most important thing is we don't move on until they've mastered the concept. That's really important. Because in, in a regular school setting, if the child doesn't make benchmarks by the end of the year, it typically goes on. And then by fourth grade, we're not talking about letters and sounds and syllables anymore. We're talking about other things. You know, those were, there, were 70, there were 70 kids in those little one-ring schoolhouses. It could certainly be done with now, for, you know, I much prefer one-on-one. -on -one. I've taught hands and things like that. And it's really hard to kind of keep up with, with the comprehension going on in the classroom. I, I don't know how teachers do it, frankly. I, I really have tremendous admiration for them. Um, but, you know, for, for, for the severe dyslexic, there's no substitute for the one-on-one. -on -one. But it can be done in the classroom. And I would argue that if, if K through three taught the way I'm going to show you, then by fourth grade, we really wouldn't know who was dyslexic. Mm -hmm. Unless they had other issues that were 
Okay, so these are just some phonological awareness uh, activities, like just listening activities, rhyming. These are the things that um, are done, should be done in, in kindergarten, first grade. That um, segmenting, segmenting the sentence, the, the words in a sentence. You'd be amazed if you did this with some students, how they really don't, they don't hear the discrete words and sentences. They need a lot of practice <coughs> um, and they pick it up pretty quickly. And if you use multi-sensory materials, then they really get it quickly. Um, okay. Right. So that's, that's phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness. Beryl and uh, Jager Adams came up with the five levels of phonemic awareness. Um, and it's rhyming and alliteration. Um, Onset of a word is the first sound that you hear, onset, and then rhyme is everything that follows. And that's not R-H-Y-M-E, it's R-I-N-E, onset rhyme. Um, so, so students need to, to really think about the sounds that they're hearing and be able to manipulate them. Eventually that's the goal. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that I teach a letter, and I, I can show you what an example. This is a uh, this is a little book that I put together. You can get these things at Staples for five six bucks. It's twenty. It's forty eight pages of sheet protectors, and I just put um, the letters in here. There's letters, digraphs, trigraphs, and whatnot. There's a um, so the students get to see the print capital and lowercase, the cursive cap uppercase, lowercase, a keyword object that's very important that triggers the memory of the sound, and then a traceable uh, letter in cursive with the writing lines, and then uh, the rule. There's, there are rules that govern uh, where letters can show up in a syllable, so they get whatever rule is associated. And um, I usually give this to students to take home and practice at home um, so that they build up their automaticity for cursive. So there's a big rule for S because there's you know, things you need to know about uh, how you spell the sound in the beginning, middle, or end of the syllable. So, uh, so I make a big deal about making sure that a child can produce accurate speech sounds and write gorgeous cursive shapes and connect those shapes. Um, and I want to mention something about speech sounds. When students come to me, almost all of them, or I'd say 95%, will say a sound, um, like, I'll just go through the, well, the consonant, ba, da, fa, ga. And what they're doing is they're adding uh, what we call a schwa sound. They're adding an a uh sound. That has to be clipped off, because in a word like that, E A T. We don't say B A T. So we want to make sure that everybody knows to clip those sounds. They're really short clip sounds. It's really important. Um, okay. So what do we have to teach? There are uh, short and long vowels, consonant blends like B L and C R. There. Are there are 22 consonants that can be blended together smoothly before a vowel, and 17 consonants that can be blended smoothly after a vowel in a word. So we have to teach those. Combinations are uh, two letters like Q-U and, and um, W-H. We treat those as combinations because you can, they don't really blend. They don't, they don't really blend together well, but they're something special. Digraphs, two letters that come together to make one sound like sh. Uh, trigraphs like E G E or T C H, quadrigraphs or uh, uh, E I G H and things like that. And then the diphthongs, oi, ow. We label those, teach those very explicitly, and you have a 12 year old linguist on your hands. Okay. Um, I mentioned the discovery teaching, multi sensory linkage procedure. I go from introducing I'll say to a student, I'm going to say some words, you listen for the sound that you hear at the beginning of the word, 
they, they identify that sound, they reach in the bag, they pull out the keyword object, and then I go on to show them how to map the cursive onto the print through a multi-sensory linkage procedure. They're using a large motor, and um, and then they go from you know, naming the letter and writing it in cursive all the way to getting the sound and writing the cursive. So we're going from reading to spelling in a short period of time in one you know four minute uh, instructional task. And then we practice every day, every day. Every time I see that student, we're always practicing the old and unfolding in the new. So it's that it's that repetition, 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 visual, auditory, kinesthetic that gets it in. So telling is not teaching. Teaching is making sure that there is that, that, that necessary automaticity. Um, syllable instruction. Most of my students don't even know what a syllable is when they come to me. That's like a doctor not knowing what a kidney is. They need to know what a syllable is when they're learning to read. Um, it's a group of sounds. It's a letter or a group of letters that is one push of breath. Must have a vowel. Um, it can be a base word itself, like dog, or it can be a tag syllable, like um, um, al, in the word alphabet. And then the other important thing, and this is what makes uh, folks think that language is impossibly difficult to teach, it's that letters, like numerals, have a certain place value. So for example, the letter Y, at the beginning of a word, will make the sound not yeah, it's, it's sort of voice, it's a hard sound to make. So it'll only make that sound at the beginning of a word. At the end of a word, it will make the sound E or I. So it has a place value. We have to know that, and there are rules that students learn so that they understand. Okay, this is really important. Okay, how many words in the dictionary? We say there's 26 letters, 44 or 45 speech sounds, 98 ways in aggregate to spell those sounds. How many words in the English dictionary, the Oxford English, if you counted all those words, all the, all the, uh, I think anybody want to take a guess? It's going to blow your mind. Anybody, one guess. 20,000? 20, 750,000. 750, it's the biggest dictionary in the world. Um, what an amazing, amazing language. What an amazing language. Uh, if you took all of those words and cut them up into their syllables, you would only come up with these six patterns. These are not taught in most classrooms today. They're not taught. Why? Because we've got these word walls, right? And we're asking kids to memorize these words. And we're not giving them the keys to their language. We are giving them the fish dinner. We are not teaching them to fish. That is the problem. If you teach the students, first grade, second grade, the six types of syllables, you're giving them a way to spell. You are giving them a strategy for decoding words of any length or complexity. Um, you're, you're teaching them how to divide words into syllables because there are rules that go along with, with these syllables. These are the six. That's it, there are no more. <laughs> okay, these there are nine syllable division patterns. Nine. So we're gonna um, divide between two consonants and accent the first syllable, or we're gonna divide between two consonants and accent the second syllable. Or we're gonna not have two consonants to divide between, so we have to divide after the first vowel, creating what we call an open syllable, where that vowel is going to give its long naming sound. Um, I don't have time to really go into <coughs> this, but I want you to appreciate that while this is complex, it's also relatively finite. And teachers can learn, future teachers can learn this in a couple of courses in their uh, graduate program. It, it should happen. There's no reason why why pre-service teachers can't learn this stuff. Okay, spelling instruction. There are um, a couple of spelling rules. There's probably a dozen really great spelling rules. How many of you grew up with I before E except after C? How many still use it? 
Okay. <laughs> Imagine if you had these as well. These is what, like, for the sound k, there are four ways to spell that sound. Um, and my animal students know k before e, i, and y, the beginning of a syllable, k before e, i, and y, c before a, o, u, or in a consonant, at the end of a syllable, k after a consonant, a naming vowel, or a double vowel, c after a closed vowel, and two or more syllable base words, and ck after a vowel, and a one syllable base word. You're looking at a very dyslexic person. If I can know this, <laughs> anybody can know this. Um, and then there are uh, rules for, for adding a sil uh, suffixes to base words. So that's really essentially um, the, the host of spelling rules that students need to learn. Okay. Cursive, I talked a little bit about cursive and why that's important. I teach the basic shapes, I teach the writing lines, approach to families. So there are like say, how many people in your family? Five. Okay. I have five people in my family. Um, well, the cursive, uh, the uh, lowercase cursive letters belong to families too. There's the long swing up, like L and F and T. There's the short swing up, like I, S, and J, and so forth. There's the over the clock, over the top to the two o'clock dot. That's the A, the C, the D. So if you teach those families and give them mantras, over the top to the two o'clock dot, trace back around up to the top line, pull straight down, swing up. The kids absorb these mantras, and then they have those to fall back. Um, and I mentioned that. Um, I have a fifth grade student. You can see the dates at the bottom, October 5th. We started, I started working with this boy in September. Um, this was a, a reading activity. Um, I'm teaching in literary analysis, so we read a, a fable, and then we did a graphic organizer looking at character traits, plot points, and themes. And then a month later, I said, I pulled it out and I said to him, could you just do a, a copy of this, just do a near point copy, just don't change any of the words, just write in cursive what you wrote. Um, they did a study, they gave, um, we don't have much time to go into this, but they, they, they had somebody write in sloppy print, and then a neat cursive uh, essay, and the essays contained the exact same number of errors, and they sent out these essays to a bunch of teachers in the study, and the beautiful cursive always got the better score. <laughs> so a lot of judgments are made about the presentation of students' work. But it also is really important for spelling, for reasons that I need to know. Uh, reading comprehension, um, we do a lot. Once they're reading, we focus on, on uh, semantics and text analysis. I, I think even kids who really struggle to read should be reading all the time. It's, it's, it's hard for them and it's, it's painful, but they should be listening to books on like tape and following along and getting help from a certified uh, specialist until they can read independently. But the exposure to print, the exposure to language is so critically important. Um, and then there are specific skills that you can do to help them understand um, the, the stories that they're reading or the, the nonfiction that they're reading. I love graphic organizers, I use them all the time, and I teach students how to make their own graphic organizer based on the kind of project or assignment that they're doing. And um, I think it's really important that they look up unfamiliar words. That will help with comprehension too. Most of my students struggle with comprehension because their vocabularies are so, are so impoverished because they don't read. Um, as I said earlier, I teach the Greek and Latin morphemes. It, 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 and this is why I love this so much. It, and again, it's like the fish dinner versus the teaching of the fish. So if, um, if I said to you right now, let's think of all the words we can with the root jet. What would you say? Jet. Object, reject, reject, project, project, subject, subject, and the SAT word, conjecture, interjection, objectify, subject. projectile. Okay, so we then say, well, object is, is the common root in all these words, 
can we figure out what Jack means based on um, based on uh, the similarities of these words? So what do we think Jack means? If you reject the peach at the farmer's market, what do you do? You throw it back. So a projectile is thrown through the air, that kind of thing. So if you learn that Jack means to throw, then you can recognize that much of it in a word you've never seen before, and you're on your way to decoding the meaning of the word. So I don't like the wordly lies books. I don't like these uh, vocab lists. I like lists of words that have a shared root or, or a shared prefix or suffix. So, um, so you learn a family of words. And if you expose a child to about 130 morphemes, they have the keys to unlocking the meaning of about 14,000 words. This is great for kids who are approaching the SAT, ACT. <coughs> Our language is basically three layers. There's the Anglo-Saxon layer. Those words are really hard to spell, but their meanings are universally understood, like walk, rain, thing, truck, sheep. They're the words of the body, of the farm, of the weather. Anglo-Saxon, peasant, you know, kind of word. The, the Latin layer of the language, um, and they're the greatest number of words in our dictionary. Their meanings are far more abstract, but they're relatively easy to spell. So we we ask little ones to spell hard words, <laughs> and then we give the middle and high schoolers the words that are hard to understand and easy to spell. So it's, uh, but this really helps with comprehension. Academic writing. Uh, I want to give you a couple minutes to ask questions. Um, I like the idea of teaching with multi-sensory tools all the way through college and beyond. So I teach with Legos. This is a perfect paragraph. The green is the, th is the topic sentence. The yellow are the details and the red is the conclusion. So if my student has a five paragraph essay, I can write this first. This is your argument, your thesis, your claim. These are the three prongs of your argument. These are the three reasons why you know you're right. This is your conclusion. This is a model of a five paragraph essay. So to actually build the, build the model, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the type of sentence, so universal statement, linking statement, thesis, now you see that we break this apart. So the teacher said, great, you have, a, you have a great argument. Now you're ready to blow it up into a full-blown uh, essay, like acorn oak, that's why I have that picture up there. So this comes apart. This is now, oops, this is now uh, the thesis. This is topic sentence one, body paragraph with details, quotes, analysis, things like that. Little orange thing for transition to the next topic sentence. And, um, and then, uh, so you can see the three body paragraphs, the concluding paragraph, and the intro paragraph. And so what my students tell me, and I have a student here who said this to me, all I do is I remember the colors when I go in for my in-class writing assignment. I know I need a white sentence, a pale green sentence, a dark green sentence, three yellow sentences, lots of blue sentences, and I know that I need to make my conclusion better than just a restatement of my thesis. So, um, so very process oriented for academic writing in the middle and high school. Um, uh, a lot of brainstorming and categorizing. Um, what grade are you starting? Like third grade? Or? And then this I use, I have kids in college who I can break out the Legos. Kids love using Legos. It's very, very tactile and memorable, colorful. These kids are great at, at um, pattern recognition. They're not good with semantics so much, language, but they're great at pattern recognition. And so the colors will take them to the language. That's, that's what it is. Um, okay. Oh, brainstorming and categorizing. A lot of um, teachers give assignment sheets. And they sometimes give a template. You know, you need a body paragraph, you need, or you need three body paragraphs, intro paragraph conclusion. They give them the template. But they don't tell them how to go from assignment to the writing. And so I tell students, brainstorm, brainstorm your ideas, brainstorm your ideas, categorize, uh, lift you know, put them down on a web, and then categorize them. Look for logical clusters, groupings. That that ends up um, taking you to your your, detail, your, your, uh, your reasons, which I wish we had more time. But anyway, academic writing is a good piece of it. So, uh, so what you do, join the IDA if you're so interested. 
There's some information right up here on the stool. Um, showing the encoding dyslexia movement in your area. These folks are doing incredible work. We have a uh, dyslexia pilot program that we're trying to get through in the state of Maryland. Um, this will mean uh, uh, instruction in the classroom for dyslexics in hopefully eight public schools in the state. Um, and based on the results, it would be rolled out. It would, uh, it hopefully, it would be very effective and it will be rolled out. But anyway, that's in the works. And the decoding dyslexia people are really making that happen. These are the folks who are going to the state houses and saying, you know, we need change here. Um, right to the heads of education departments, they need to know that they're not serving their teachers well. In fact, kids are coming into, into college without the reading and writing skills that they need. So the chickens are kind of coming home to roost. Um, and uh, again, encourage your child to read even though it's uh, hard right now. So that's, that's the Questions? I know we have to submit it. We have to allow them. We have to allow them. Pardon me? We have to allow them. We have to allow them. That's perfect. Okay. That's even better. Than kind of, I wanted to make sure you had plenty. I think I know you have questions. So what, what guidance do you have of um, bilingual parents of it depends on the child. Um, Spanish is wonderful because there's really nice one-to-one -one correspondence between the sounds of the letters. Unlike English, we have 19,000. Um, I also know students who are dyslexic who were, went into Spanish aversion and they really struggled there and came out and then ended up in academic therapy for several years. Um, uh, it's it's just a it's it depends on the child. But I would say if, if uh, I would say if the child is, is in school learning English and is moderately to severely dyslexic, I would postpone uh, that second language until that the the, uh, the English is intact because the vowel system in Spanish is almost the opposite of the vowel system. English, and we really want to make sure that of all the letters, those vowel sounds are pure and understood and absorbed. So, but I do strongly believe in bilingual education. I think it's great, and it's helpful in lots and lots of ways. Yeah. What I have found is that my students uh, have the dexterity to type, and if they're given a good typing instruction, they can learn to type pretty, pretty easily, pretty quickly. I will have, I will teach a student to type while I'm teaching them cursive. I don't think it's, I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. Uh, there are, what's happening in the brain when students are typing is very different than what they're, what's happening when they're writing in cursive. So they're not, they're not tapping into the same uh, brain regions. And so let's say for example, a, a child had the opportunity to handwrite his or her notes or type them into a tablet during class, they will remember more what they handwrote than what they typed. So um, I have some students who dictate into, uh, into their laptops to write essays. So I don't think there's any one best way, but I do strongly believe in the impact of cursive writing learning on language development generally. And what I have found, and like you saw that side-by-side -side comparison, um, and this is true of virtually all of my students over the last 20 years, when they learn cursive, they switch, and they make that wholesale switch to cursive, and they don't often like it because they're slower at first, and they're worried about taking notes in class when they're, when they're writing to slow, to slow down a lot. Um, but what I find is that their written output doubles, triples, quadruples within a matter of months when they make that switch and they get comfortable with it. Because something has happened in the brain around language in general. They've automatized letter shapes and sounds. They're spelling uh, much more fluently. So that creates um, more room for thinking, for, for uh, sentence uh, development in the brain before they start to write. So they're really shifting from the mechanics of writing to the thinking behind writing. That's what we want. 
I was just going to say, I found the same thing with the, using the text or the talk to text software and that kind of accommodation. Mm -hmm. While they're not getting the handwriting, it frees up all of this space for actually That's thinking. Right. That's right. So when my son writes something out, he's going to write, you know, four lines. When he speaks something out, it's, you know, a page right. without him even right. trying. So it's, yeah, it's right. really. But it's a skill. The writing is a skill you definitely want to work on aggressively because in a lot of jobs, you have yeah. to write. And so, uh, I, I mean, I love assistive technology. I love accommodations. But we really want to be aggressively working on the skill. Those are bridges. Those tools are bridges. I don't look at them as, as substitutes for good reading, good spelling, good writing, good handwriting. Those surely can be in all but, you know, just a few students. I mean, I've had students who were so distracted that, you know, they, they went on to a keyboard. It was, it was really the only thing for them to do. Why was the reason they took her to the schools? Was it because the teachers don't have time to teach it? Or what was the reason? What was the reason? I don't have to know that get funding. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's been, but it's been but they look at it, they look at it like calligraphy. Right? It's like it's almost like art class. We're gonna write we're gonna draw a letter. So they didn't even like, look at the research or any of that stuff. They just decided to get a letter and just said, well, we don't need this anymore. It it was a time issue. Yeah, right. And yet it's so fundamentally important. And if it is taught, like I said, at the moment of learning letter name and sound, that you're creating a good speller because that's what we do. All of us, if we're all good spellers in this room, what we do below the level of our consciousness is that we are we are writing sounds. We're writing sounds. We hear, we don't even hear the sounds because it's so, 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 it's so automatic now. Like we don't think about what our hand is doing when we brush our teeth. So, um, uh, the Catholic schools still teach it. <laughs> but they're not teaching, they're not teaching it in conjunction with letter sounds. No, they're not. They're uh, not but, you know, a lot of what they do is based on, um, on the, uh, I'll tell you, this study came out two years ago. The question was, who does, which school does a better job of preparing uh, students for college? Private, public, or parochial? And, what they, and, they, and they, uh, they uh, controlled for socioeconomics. And what they found was that, you know, good kids are gonna do well <coughs> in any environment. But there was one group that was off the charts. And these were the kids who were taught by the social board, the, uh, the Holy Orders, like the Jesuits. I thought, what is that? Is that a character training or something? Is it, is it, what is that? Is it just, well, what I found was that they, they use a, a, a teaching philosophy called eloquencia perfecta, which goes back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And the idea there is that, um, that, uh, you know, they used to call it grammar school for a reason, so that the first five, six years, kids were working on basic skills. They were working on their letters to perfection. They were working on sounds, syllables, grammar concepts, punctuation, sentence building, all of these things which are so boring, right? We gotta get rid of them because that's just not fun. I went into a, cl a kindergarten classroom at a local preschool, and there was the uh, C6 H12 O6 on a flip chart. And I went in, I said, I'm sorry, I, I just have, could I ask a quick question? Is this really, you're teaching photosynthesis to kids who don't have their vowel sounds? Like, I'm not supposed to do that, I never go in, I never say anything, <laughs> I never do. You know, I really respect what, what's happening in schools and in the classroom. I have my little world, I stay in my world. But this just took my breath away. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Um, what, what they did was by focusing on these foundational skills, the kids were ready for middle school. They could now start learning about the world of ideas. And they had those, they had those. They could write a paragraph. They could, they could, do, they could prove a point. They could defend an idea. Um, and you look at it now and you know, I asked the, the assistant head of a, of a school recently, what percentage of your students are ready to do the academic writing in college? And he said 20%. <laughs> 38,000 
thousand dollars a year to find out that you have an eighty percent chance of not being able to write when you get the uh, help. Yeah. Quick question: How early would you start then? Like, I do kindergarten. Would I start as early as that? Like, you know, early on the path, or oh, phonological learning. And so you make aware of that. Absolutely. Huge, huge, huge. And things like that that, that helps students hear discrete sounds. Okay. And then cursive handwriting. Yeah, like cursive. Can I start with cursive? Oh, my God. The reason why kids write like this is because they're picking up pencils and pens and crayons before they're neurologically. And they imprint, this gets imprinted in the brain. So that by the time they're 12, this is excruciating for them. They can't do this. So they write like this for the rest of their lives. I, for me, I would say for the first year, two years, if you're not ready to do this, don't pick up a pencil or use a grip. There's a wonderful grip out there called the claw. You can look, just look at, on the internet, go to Amazon, the claw. It's got three little suction cups. You can slide it on the pencil. The little suction cups hold the fingers right where they're supposed to be. That creates that tripod grip. So if, you, if kids have to write, they should at least have a grip so that their muscles are trained how to hold And that, because I went to another one where we use the triangle crayons as well. So does that help as well? Those are good. I love okay. triangles. Yeah. There's some, some grips are so bulky and awful. Kids don't want to use them. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I love those little suction grips. I wish I brought them. Okay. But um, they should be hearing language, rhyme and nursery rhymes clapping, doing all kinds of things at the oral level for a really long time, and then no invented spelling, please no invented spelling, because this they're practicing their mistakes for a lifetime. <laughs> and, and there are words that are true sight words, like the word said. It's not phonetically regular. They need sight words. But most of the sight words that they're getting are not true sight words. They're very 95% rule-based language. It's not as crazy as most people think. So teach them the sounds, teach them the syllable patterns, teach them syllable division, <coughs> teach them to spell sound by syllable by syllable, sound by sound. That's how you do it. Totally doable. I do it every day.